Welcome everyone, and uh, just wanted to say um, thanks for coming out. Um, please just come worship with us. We're asking that you don't sing again this week, um, but just please just worship in your heart. And I'm going to pray for the service. Lord, just come be with us as we worship, and uh, bless Tony as he brings the word. Amen. All right, why don't you stand? And as Jack said, just worship in your own way without your voice, if possible, for now. <laughs> and I'm just really, I'm just going to say, I'm glad Tony's here. Every time he comes, he just, even though he's speaking and pretty much doing a bunch of other things, he's like, yeah, throw me in there as well. And Noah, just thanks. It's going to be awesome. So let's do it.
and grab a seat. All right, so it's uh, my pleasure to welcome Pastor Tony tonight. And uh, it's my understanding that he had uh, a role in early Kawartha Community Church, which is really cool. Some of you may recognize him. And, uh, and he's working with Youth Unlimited now, which we're going to hear a little bit more about. Awesome. So yeah, without further ado, Pastor Tony. Thanks, Jack. Uh, yeah, it is uh, really great to be here again uh, with you guys, whether it be in person. And I can, I recognize some people from like the nose bridge up, you know, <laughs> um, and then other people I don't, but that's okay. And then obviously those of you that are joining us online from the comfort of your home, uh, welcome to KCC. It is awesome to be here. And it's really weird actually for me to be in this particular building because this is actually where I, met, where I met Scott and Krista 20, I don't even want to know, a long time ago. Um, and uh, this is when Scott was the young adults pastor here, uh, ran center stage in the lobby. Scott and I used to get in a lot of trouble here at the church where we would do things that the senior pastor didn't know we were doing. Like, I'm sure you've heard the story of us drilling holes in the concrete wall so we could run a coffee station over there. So I could actually show you later on if you want to know where that is. Uh, we got in trouble for that one. Um, and then I remember being on this stage. It looked a little different. There was an organ and a piano over here. And I was just, I was like, I don't know, 19, maybe 20, probably 19, actually, 18 maybe even. Anyway, I was just learning how to lead worship. And... Um, I got a call at like 2 o'clock in the afternoon from the senior pastor on a Sunday. And that's back when they had Sunday evening services. And he said, uh, I said, Tony, um, I know you haven't done it yet, because I'd only done stuff for center stage out in the lobby uh, with all my peers, so like low pressure, lots of fun. And he said, I know you haven't done it yet, but um, we need someone to lead the music tonight. Uh, we have a full band to play with you, but we need someone to lead. So the person that was supposed to lead worship that night uh, had fallen ill in the afternoon. And the other two people they had that were worship leaders were away. And so there's literally no one to do music. And so, and so I'm like, uh, you know, being 19 and foolish, I'm like, sure, sign me up. Please, so I go on. Anyway, so I'm, I'm doing the, the songs, and uh, thankfully they all knew the songs that I knew, so we changed the whole thing. And uh, let's see if I can, yeah. So this thing right here, I know I'm off screen, but anyway, I'm back. Um, so this little tool right here is called a capo. And, you know, we, as guitarists, we use it all the time to change the chord or the key of the song that we're playing in. Sometimes it's a cheater thing, so if it's in a really terrible chord, that's really hard for a guitarist to play. A penis can play, but it's harder for a guitarist to play. We'll throw this on and, and make it simpler. And so what I had done that very first time leading worship in this church, and there was probably about 150, 200 people in the pews, um, I had left my capo on from one song to the next. But the problem was that second song shouldn't have had a capo on. And so I had the capo on, third fret, so pretty, you know, and I'm, and I'm just, I'm starting. It was right after, it, oh yeah, that's what, I remember it was right after the offering. Like everything was kind of solemn and, you know, all that kind of reflective kind of thing that you do in a church service sometimes. And I just started playing the next song. And I can still remember the song, but anyway, I started playing the next song. And the introduction, like I was supposed to start and then about a bar in, uh, the piano and the organ were supposed to join in and the bass player, and they didn't. <laughs> and I'm like, what's going on? Why is this not, right? And then all of a sudden, I, I, I'm like, wait a minute, this song is way too high. <laughs> and I looked, and there's my capo. So I, I, literally, so I literally did, on a Sunday evening, first time leading worship in a church, I stopped playing, pulled my capo off, and said, let's try that again. <laughs> and everyone laughed, and then we started playing. And so that was kind of like my, uh, my introduction to leading worship, and I've learned a lot since then, uh, and I still make mistakes a whole lot. Um, but, you know, I've learned that we just kind of roll with the punches and you have fun because that's what we're supposed to do as people. So, uh, and maybe that's part of the lesson right now. Um, so first off, to uh, introduce you to, uh, to introduce myself to those of you that don't know me, Jack, thanks for introducing me earlier. But um, So yeah, I have been part of, I had been part of KCC for a long, long time. Uh, my wife, Teresa, and I were part of the planting team that started this. We were about two weeks in, actually, so we were a little bit, we were kind of like the, the, the slow adopters. Um, but we came in two weeks, two weeks in, and uh, we're part of KCC family for 14 years before God called us 
to full-time um, ministry and mission work in Northumberland County with Youth Unlimited. And um, I don't know if you've got, did I, do you have my PowerPoint? I can't remember if I sent it. Oh, look, it's right there. Sweet. Good deal. Um, so you can throw my family picture up there. Yeah, so that's us uh, last summer. Uh, we had the chance to go to Quebec City for our national ministry conference. And um, that was a lot of fun to be able to go to Quebec City and meet with four, over 400 staff from Youth Unlimited, Youth for Christ, from across the country, from Vancouver Island all the way to Cape Breton and everywhere in between. And so we had a chance to go to Quebec City, and this is a waterfall that's about 15 minutes outside of Quebec City, so we had a lot of fun with that. Um, oldest on the right with the shades is Caleb. Noah's in the middle. He was playing Cajon today. Obviously, Teresa, and then down below on the left uh, is Ben, and the right is Sam, and then myself there. Um, so we had a lot of fun doing that. Uh, I just got back from vacation yesterday, um, and we, we did a camping trip together, the six of us, uh, in the interior of Algonquin uh, Park. We canoed up to our site, had lots of fun. I'm still kind of in vacation mode, so if I fall asleep mid-message, it's not that it's boring, I'm just really tired. Um, but no, it'll be fun. It was, it was a lot of fun to do that. So, um, another quick introduction for myself in the sense of, of Youth Unlimited. So yes, I serve with Northumberland Youth Unlimited. I am the executive director there for that chapter, and it's basically Coburg, Port Hope, Campbellford, that kind of whole area. But the other thing that I get to do, which is actually part of my ministry, is I get to serve as the team chaplain of the Cobra Cougars hockey team. And that's a junior A hockey team, so it's one level below the Peterborough Peets. And that is um, just an incredible privilege and um, blessing for me to do. It's something that I had no idea I was going to do when I said yes to Youth Unlimited, uh, when we said yes to God. Um, we really, it wasn't even anywhere on my radar. Uh, what happened was when I arrived in Coburg, our board chair introduced me to a local Christian businessman who at that time was a part owner of the Coburg Cougars. And so he said, you need to meet with this guy. And so I met with this guy. And then uh, I think our second meeting, uh, this businessman says to me, um, so uh, we need a chaplain for the Coburg Cougars. Would you be interested in doing that? <laughs> My first response is, what's a chaplain? <laughs> what am I? No idea. Um, and so I called a friend of mine who's the chaplain of the Peterborough Peets, and I got all sorts of information from him, and so my wife and I talked about it and prayed about it and decided, yeah, like this is actually fits perfectly with what we're trying to do with Youth Unlimited in the Coburg area, uh, and to be able to serve the needs, the mental, spiritual, emotional, and physical needs of the hockey players uh, that are ages 16 to 20 uh, was a perfect fit. And so I did that. And so one kind of quick update, because I could update you about a whole lot of things that we're doing in Youth Unlimited, but I don't want to take 45 minutes. So I'll take like quickly two minutes. So one update has been this whole COVID thing, right? We all know what this COVID thing is and how it's affected everything we do from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to bed. And so this summer, I was starting to think, okay, what does chaplaincy look like for the Cobra Cougars? We don't know when the hockey season is going to start. Uh, there's going to be all sorts of, uh, you know, requirements and limitations and guidelines, and we're not always sure. And so, um, so it was really interesting. So I was just praying about that and trying to figure out what do we do? Like normally I meet with the guys every two weeks. I bring pizza in. Uh, that kind of feels like maybe that's not the right thing to do anymore. <laughs> the communal pizza. pizza. Um, you know, I do chapel the guys right in the dress room. Everyone's like really snug together, 20 guys around a dress room, and I do chapel with them. And, and so I'm trying to figure out what, you know, what does chapel look like? What does the chaplaincy program look like for a hockey team in the midst of a pandemic? And um, so I thought, well, I'm going to email the head coach and just let him know that I'm thinking about, you know, brainstorming about what next season looks like. And uh, he said, that's perfect, actually. Can we meet on Zoom with the assistant GM and myself and you, the three of us, next Tuesday at 2 o'clock? Like, sure. So I go on Zoom, which, of course, we've all done way too many Zoom meetings in the last six months. Um, but I, I go on Zoom, and it was just really neat. So this head coach, who I'd only known um, for about half of the season last year, he came on as assistant coach, and then he took over as head coach. And um, he said, the first thing he said to the assistant GM, who is brand new, who I had never met before, he said this. He said, Tony is a vital part of our program, and whatever we need to do to make chapel work, we need to do. Coolest thing I've ever heard. And so through this conversation, this is what chapel and chaplaincy program will look like for this coming season. One of the things that the head coach really wants to focus on is the idea of a wellness check, because he says, uh, he said, I recognize that this season of any other season is going to be very difficult for the guys because of all this, the COVID restrictions, including travel restrictions. And so what that means is, he said, you know, in the past, if one of the players had a girlfriend that went to Queen's University at Kingston, 
they could just drive to Kingston for the day, see their girlfriend and come back. That's not going to happen this season. Everybody will be required to stay in their billet home or at least in the community of Coburg or Port Hope, wherever they're living, stay with the team when they need to be with the team, and that's it. Um, there's even talks about guys not being able to go home for Christmas for the Christmas break because of travel restrictions around COVID. Um, if we're allowed to have American players, which we normally have a one or two, if we're allowed to have American players in the league, they will be required to stay in Coburg or with the team the entire season long. Like, no going home at any time. And so he's recognizing that there's going to be a lot of emotional and mental strife, if you want to call it that way, over the season. And so uh, he wants to do wellness checks. And so as we were kind of brainstorming what that could look like, I said, hey, what if, um, what if we do wellness checks at every chapel session? Like every two weeks, we do wellness checks with the guys. We ask them, you know, some questions and, and get their feedback and figure out what kind of things they need to, to look out for and, and some, some, you know, kind of signifiers for, hey, I need to get some help or talk to somebody. And so that's actually one of the things we're doing. So we're going to build into our bi-weekly chapel sessions at the front end of it is a wellness check for the guys. And so I get to be a part of that, which is really cool. Um, and then he said, uh, we need to figure out how we can do chapel because we can't do chapel in the dressing room anymore because it's too small. And in fact, even the rules on use of the dressing room has been very, very specific by Hockey Canada. And so there's all these limitations, uh, who can go in and how long and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, they got permission from the community center where the, the team plays and has their dressing room uh, to use the stands. So after practice, I'll do chapel with the guys in the stands. And instead of bringing a communal pizza that we normally bring, we're making arrangements with a subway to make a whole bunch of six inch privately, you know, or individually wrapped subs. So we can still do food. We can still hang out together. We can still do chapel. And so it's really looking at how do we be creative in the type of ministry we do with young people in our community. And so that's just one example. And there's lots of other things we do that I could get into, uh, but I won't for time. Um, Today, tonight, we're going to talk about Psalm 91. And Psalm 91 is actually one of these amazing psalms that when you read it, you can skip through one very important line. And we're going to, I'm going to show you in a minute. So we're going to read Psalm 91 together. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn to Psalm 91. If you've got your apps, you can do that. If you're watching online, you can do that. Otherwise, you can just listen, which is actually kind of cool because like, even this whole thing of like, you know, leading worship, we were talking about this earlier. Uh, before, before the service started, like leading worship to people that can't sing and just what that feels like and looks like. And here's the thing that I've been learning more and more as you go through this whole pandemic and the reopening of things and all that kind of stuff. I wonder if God just wants us to be quiet. <laughs> like we're pretty good noisemakers, aren't we? Right? Like if you think about it, we make noise all day long. And I think sometimes, I just wonder if God is saying, I want you to be quiet. I want you to listen. And so if you have your Bible, open it. If you don't, or even if you do and you choose to, just listen. It's 16 verses, not very long. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust him. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor the arrow that flies in the day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, though ten thousand are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you, no plague will come near your home. For he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands so, they, so, that, so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. You will trample upon lions and cobras. You will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will, re will reward them with a long life and give them, give them my salvation. Now, reading this psalm sounds pretty amazing, doesn't it? All of these promises from God to protect us, to rescue us. In 16 verses, the author uses reassuring words like shelter, refuge, safety, protection, and rescue 20 times. We get excited about all the good promises of God. We love to experience his rescue, his protection, his refuge. 
We often view our relationship through God, with God through the lens of provider and protector, the God who does things for us. We find and read the Bible verses like this psalm that remind us of all these things. And we should. It's a good thing to find those verses in time of need. But when things are hard, when we lose a job, struggle with anxiety or depression, live with long-term health issues, lose a loved one, we wonder where this God, this provider and protector is. Why is this happening? We feel incapable of changing things, we feel scared, and we feel alone. But as we read this psalm, the author includes one short line in verse 15. I will be with them in trouble. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, when I'm in trouble, my default isn't to all of a sudden remember, oh yes, God is with me. In fact, psychology tells us that as humans, when it comes to responding to trouble, to danger, to stress, we actually have three human responses. Fight, flight, or freeze. Now, flight is the response when your brain assesses the danger or stress and believes that you have the power to overcome it, and your body goes into fight mode. Your adrenaline increases, your heart rate increases, your breathing speeds up, you become more aware of your surroundings, you're ready to do battle. Now, flight is the opposite. When your brain assesses that the danger or stress is too powerful to overcome, your impulse is to run, get out of there. Same kind of physiological responses, but a different outcome. You're getting out of there as fast as you can. Now, freeze is a disabling response. Your brain has assessed that it can neither defeat nor overcome this danger or stress. There are no physiological responses to drive you to move in a certain direction. You feel helpless and paralyzed. But I believe that God is actually inviting us to respond in a fourth way. Rest. Now, I know that sounds absolutely crazy, but stick with me and let's learn together. So how does rest help us in times of trouble? Well, to understand rest, we actually need to understand God's promise of with. In this psalm, the word with means fellowship or companionship with the help of or of actions done jointly with another. Let me say that again. Fellowship or companionship with the help of or of actions done jointly with another. Several times through this psalm, the author's words are about a relationship those who live in the shelter of the Most High. If you make the Lord your refuge, the Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. When they call on me, I will answer. When I was a kid, uh, our family was camping at Lake Lake St. Peter Provincial Park uh, near Maynooth, and we went there every summer to, to camp with friends of ours, and we're swimming in this lake, And I was floating on a large tire tube. My dad was a truck driver, and so he had access to all these big tubes. Remember those big black inner tubes? You don't see them anymore, but the big, huge black inner tubes um, with the air nozzle on the end that you had to be careful of because it's depending which direction it faced. Anyway, so we've got that thing, and I'm I'm swimming in this lake. I'm jumping off the tube, having all sorts of fun. And this one time, I jump off the tube, and, and I was in water that was just above my head. I think it was about eight years old. It was just above my head. And so what I would do, like any kid does, is you swim down to the bottom, and you push off with your feet, and you get to the surface. Well, this particular time, I swim down to the bottom, I push off with my feet, and I hit the bottom of the tube. And so I do like any other kid does. I go back down, and I push off again, except this time I hit the bottom of the tube again. I did it a couple of times, and I couldn't get out of the water. I kept on hitting the tube, and so I looked up, and I see this black shadow ahead of me. And so I move over a couple of feet when I'm down underwater, and I push off again, and I hit the tube again. And just kept on happening again and again and again. Well, now I'm starting to panic. I can't breathe, right? I can't swallow water. I'm actually starting to swallow water a little bit. So I'm starting to panic. I'm starting to freak out. And all I can remember is my dad reaching out, uh, reaching down with his strong arms and just pulling me out of the water. And see, when God is with you in trouble, sometimes God does the rescuing for you, like my dad did for me. We love the I will rescue those who love me part, don't we? But sometimes God does the rescuing with you. Let me give you an example. Um, For those of you that have known us for a long time, know the story, so bear with me as I share it again. But our son, Ben, required open-heart surgery when he was just 10 months old. And on surgery day, day, we arrived at SickKids Hospital at really early in the morning, went through all the pre-op procedures and all that kind of stuff. And then Ben's name is called in the waiting room. And it's like, it was like the movies where you had this like team of four or five people 
dressed head to toe in white, covered, everything's covered, and they basically just, you know, they took Ben from Teresa's arms into the surgery room. And there's two things that stick with me since that day. And the one was when, in that moment, when the surgical team came and grabbed Ben, who at that point was all drugged up and loopy, uh, <laughs> and when they, they, they took him from Teresa and brought him into the surgical room and the, the two doors close, and there was this, at that moment, there was an absolute, utter feeling of helplessness. That for the first time in my parenting life, he was our third son, in the first time in my parenting life, there was nothing I could do to protect or save my son. Nothing. The second thing I remember is this. We were sitting in the waiting room. We waited for five hours, and Scott and Krista were with us. They drove up from Peterborough, and so they were, they were really gracious and kind to be with us and support us during that time. And, and um, you know, we, Teresa and I wanted nothing more than for the surgeons to open him up and discover that surgery wasn't needed, right? I mean, every, every parent would want that. Um, you know, that God had fixed his heart, had healed him, but that didn't happen. So for five hours... I experienced an incredible peace which I had never experienced before. So Philippians 4, verse 6 to 7 came alive to us that day. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. Then you will experience God's peace which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. The circumstance itself did not change something changed in me. Sometimes God does the rescuing with you. Sometimes God's companionship is the rescue. Sometimes God's companionship is the rescue. In fact, God never promised that we wouldn't experience trouble here on earth. Jesus told his followers in John 16 verse 33, here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. He didn't say maybe. He didn't say if you don't do these things you might. He just, he said, you will, you will experience trials and sorrows. And in Matthew 11, Jesus says this to his followers, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So Jesus invites us to rest in him, to be with him. Jesus wants to be our closest companion with us through thick and thin, in good times and bad. So what does that companionship in times of trouble look like? How do we rest in him? Well, last November, I had the opportunity to go to a retreat center that Youth Unlimited runs uh, on Vancouver Island. And it was a five-day guided spiritual retreat. And when I was there in the first session, our leader put up a picture on the screen of Jesus and his disciples in a boat in the middle of a storm. And some of you may know this story. You know, they're in the middle of the storm. The wind is blowing. uh, The waves are huge and pounding the boat. The sails are torn. And the disciples are freaking out. And then they see Jesus sleeping in the back of the boat. So the leader asked us to imagine that we were in the boat. And then she asked us this question. What would you be doing in the boat? And so I, you know, it took a few minutes like the rest of us to reflect on the picture and the question, and I realized the following. Before the storm, I see myself in the boat working, steering, if they let me, <laughs> attending to the sails, cleaning the deck, whatever needs to be done, I would be doing that work. And then during the storm, I see myself working hard to keep the boat afloat and keep the water out, just working extra hard on whatever needs to be done. And then I noticed Jesus sleeping in the back, and I'm surprised, and then I'm upset, and then I'm angry. Why is he not doing anything? Why is he just letting us suffer and work so hard with no results? Why doesn't he do what he's supposed to do, which is stop the storm and rescue us? Doesn't he care about his people? Jesus is here, but he does nothing. Why? As the retreat went on, God was telling me this. I am here in the midst of your storm, even though you can't feel it, see it, or sense it. I have not forgotten you. You are still my chosen one. So on the last day of that five-day retreat, we debriefed together as a group, sharing what our takeaway was from the week. And I thought back to that first session 
and what I imagined doing in the boat. And then I thought of all that I experienced with God that week during the retreat. My takeaway was this, rest in the midst of the storm. Now, I know that doesn't make any sense. We should be fixing the sails. We should be bailing out the water. But what was Jesus doing? He's resting. Here's what I learned, that this story was not as much about Jesus calming the storm, which he did. The story is more about Jesus modeling to us and his disciples what we should be doing in a storm, resting in him. So how do we rest in the midst of a storm? What does companionship with God in times of trouble look like? Well, there's five things we'll quickly want to cover. One is lean into your relationship with Jesus. Remember what he said, come to me, all who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. So I ask you today, are you leaning into Jesus? Are you giving him your heavy burdens? There's a couple ways in which we can lean into Jesus. The first one is this, be honest with him. One of the reasons I love the book of Psalms in the Bible is the raw emotion we see. King David, who is a famous king um, in the history of Israel, wrote many of the Psalms, and some of those Psalms he wrote before he even became the king of Israel. And those Psalms come from a place of fear, depression, and anxiety. They're raw. And sometimes I wonder, like, can God take my raw emotion? And then I got to wonder no more. He created me. He created you. He sees you. He hears you. He knows you even more and better than you know yourself. None of what you say to him surprises him. So share your feelings with him. Be real. Let it all out. And if you're not sure how to express your feelings, if you've never done that before with God, read the Psalms. Just pick a psalm. And put yourself in that psalm, in the poem that the author's writing, and say those things to God. God, I'm angry. I'm frustrated. I'm scared. I can't feel your presence. I don't know if you're here. Another way you can lean into Jesus is to simply set your, eye, your sights on him. In Matthew 14, the disciples, his followers, are in another boat, in another storm. So not the same storm from the story before, but they're in the middle of a storm. This time Jesus isn't with them. So in this middle of the storm, wind blowing, waves, everything, the whole thing, and out in the distance they see Jesus walking on the water, like actually walking on the water. And at first they thought it was a ghost, and they're terrified. But Jesus calls out to them, and he says this, Don't be afraid. Take courage. I am here. So Peter, Jesus' closest friend, he's in the boat, and he calls out to him. He says, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. And so Jesus says this, yes, come. He invites him, come on to the water. So Peter gets out of the boat. He steps out onto the water and starts walking to Jesus in the middle of a storm. But then he sees the wind and the waves. And he gets terrified and begins to sink. And he yells, Jesus, save me, save me, Lord. And of course, Jesus immediately saves him. You see, Peter took his eyes off Jesus. He saw the storm around him and freaked out. And when I read that story in the Bible, I often wonder what would Peter's experience have been if he had remained focused on Jesus and met him in the middle of the lake? What would his experience have been? Set your sights on Jesus. The second thing we we can do to be in community with him, in relationship with him, resting in him in times of trouble, is to trust in God's sovereignty. Now, what we're not talking about tonight is the sovereignty, the the kind of big picture sovereignty. We do this really well, right? We talk about the sovereignty of God when it comes to the universe and all of creation. It's easy for us to kind of get our head around that sometimes a little bit. What we're talking about here is the sovereignty of God in your own life, in your relationship with him. Famous preacher Billy Graham said this, God is your Lord and Savior. You can't have one without the other. I don't know about you, but I love the Savior part, and I wrestle with the Lord part. And I got to ask myself, in my life, do I come under God's lordship? Do I give him space to be sovereign in my own life, or do I try to control everything? Psalm 46.10 says this, Be still and know that I am God. The first part, be still. God is telling us to stop trying so hard. 
Stop trying to fix everything. Stop trying to do all of the things. And the second part, know that I am God. He is God, creator of every living thing. God most high. He is Lord over all things and all people, including political leaders, governments, health units, and you. He is God. It's really easy to trust in God's sovereignty when things are going well, isn't it? But it's a lot more difficult to trust God when things are hard. When we're in the middle of a storm and we're trying to walk to Jesus, but the wind is blowing and the waves are tossing us around. But we've got to remember this one thing about God. God sees the very thing that we cannot see in the middle of a storm. The other side of the storm. God sees that. He's there. He knows what next is for you. Third thing we can do is choose praise. I love this one, but it's really hard for me. I'll be honest. In Acts 16, the Apostle Paul and Silas were arrested. They were stripped naked. They were severely beaten with wooden rods and thrown into prison. And the Bible says this, the jailer was ordered to make sure that they didn't escape. So he put them in an inner dungeon and clamped their feet into stocks. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. <laughs> Lord, hold on a second. They were what? Okay, imagine this. They're in the middle of the inner dungeon, no windows, probably dead things everywhere and bones and all sorts of stuff. They're shackled. They can't move. They're severely beaten. They probably have open wounds all over the place in that nasty dungeon. You can imagine what that's doing to their body. And they're praying and singing. In the midst of a life-threatening experience, Paul and Silas choose praise. The second verse of the psalm that we were reading before, Psalm 91, verse 2, says this, This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety, for he is my God and I trust him. So whatever your storm is, choose praise. This I declare, God, you are good. This I declare, God, you are trustworthy. The fourth thing we can do is seek to discover. And aren't there times when we think, let's be honest, when we're going through something difficult and we think, God, isn't there a better way? Can't you just fix this? Maybe you could just speed this up a little bit, right? We think those thoughts. But then we got to remember what Jesus said. He said, let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. We so badly want that rest, but there's a lesson in the journey. Jesus wants to walk with us. So in your storm, what is Jesus teaching you? Seek to discover. When you do, Jesus will teach you, and you will find rest. And the last thing we can do is this. Take a break for you. One of the things that I have been learning how to do, and I wish I, would, I could say that I do it all the time, but I don't. I fail miserably on, at this a lot. But one of the things I have learned to do is when I'm really stressed and really busy and tackling a big problem, whatever it is, the best thing I can do for myself is go to my favorite place on the shores of Lake Ontario in Coburg and just sit and do nothing. Literally nothing. I leave my phone in the car, I sit on this bench, I look at the lake, and I sit. 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes. I just breathe, and I sit. And sometimes it's the best thing that I can do for myself. And so in the midst of a storm, in the midst of trial, in the midst of difficult times, sometimes the best thing that we can do for ourselves is just take a break. Just stop everything and just sit and be with God. You don't have to talk. You don't have to ask questions. You don't have to listen to music. You don't have to create a to-do list. Just leave it all and sit and take a refreshing break for yourself. Remember, God says this, when they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. In the middle of your storm, whatever that storm is, God says to you, I am here, even though you can't feel it, see it, or sense it. I have not forgotten you. You are still my chosen one. I try to go for a walk a few times a week, and I turn around at the same spot. And so one foggy day, you can throw the next one up, there's a foggy picture. 
So one foggy day, I took this picture. Now you can see it's pretty foggy. It's pretty bleak. It's pretty gray. It was cold. It was kind of like where you had that like misty rain kind of happening, right? Um, and there was really nothing to look at. But the very next day, at the very same time of day, I went for another walk, and I saw this picture. I took this picture. The sky is blue. The sun was out. It was bright, shining, and warm. And see, the sun is always there, even if you can't see it because of the fog. You might not feel its warmth or see its light, but it's there. Just like God, he is always with you, even if you can't feel his presence or hear his voice. He is there. The Apostle Paul wrote this encouragement to the church in Corinth. He says this, For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we, see, we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. A good friend of mine often says this, Hope is alive, and his name is Jesus. God is with you in times of trouble whether that trouble be long-term health issues, whether that trouble be financial struggles, whether that trouble be anxiety and depression, whether that trouble be uh, an exam coming up, whether that trouble be trying to figure out what you're going to do in the fall with your kids when school goes back in, whether that trouble be, I don't know what I'm going to do about work, whether that trouble be fear about what the coronavirus is going to do in a year and a half, whatever that trouble is, God is with you in that trouble. So together... Let's rest in Jesus. Father, I thank you that uh, in the midst of trouble, you are with us. I thank you that you are a God that doesn't just tell us all the things we should do and then sits back and watches us suffer, but that you are actively with us. And Jesus, I thank you that you have modeled to us what we should do in times of trouble, resting in your Father and you and in him. Thank you for that lesson. And Lord, I pray that as we continue to muddle through whatever we're muddling through today, tomorrow, the next day, next week, next month, next year, that we can always trust you, that you are there, even if we can't see you, feel your presence, or hear your voice. We thank you for that. In your name we pray. Thank you, Tony. That was, that was awesome. I love when you come back and it's just a breath of fresh air. <laughs> he was my mentor when uh, I first learned leading worship. So there's a, uh, I just love when he comes back with us. Why don't you stand? We're gonna, we're gonna sing a couple songs and close. Um, yeah. <laughs>
circumstance we have that you are a rock and you are there and father help us to rest uh, in you in the coming weeks in the coming days and months as as uncertainty goes on that we know that you are a rock amen all right so thank you uh, for being with us whether you're at home um, or here um, before you go um, if uh, you need to do uh, an offering that's at the back on your way out on the right and as you leave we just ask that back to front exits just through the middle aisle there. So thanks for being with us and we'll see you next week.